kidding. Yeah. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Wide awake? I'm going to be honest, I had a very busy Saturday, so I'm still trying to catch up on some sleep, you know? <laughs> but we have a couple of announcements. What? What's that? Catching up on sleep? You don't know. Well, I, I'm, star- I'm starting to learn, I'm starting to forget how to catch up on sleep. I'm going to be honest. I'm adulting, as Luke says. <laughs> The laughter concerns me because that means it's true. (laughs) So I have a couple of announcements, and then we'll get into some worship. Uh, First off, we have our prayer focus. And in our community, we have the Promise in Homeless Shelter and the Transitional transitional Housing. Uh, It's operated by Cape Co. And they kind of help homeless people get back on their feet, help them find housing, help them move forward. In our, uh, we have another church to pay for, the Adams Community Church. And in our missional, we have Mark and Kathy, or Casey, it's probably Kathy, um, Fulton, uh, from Haiti. Uh, They kind of work with the Church of God, and they help with uh, the hospitals, and they help with uh, um, just helping around, spreading the gospel, pitching them wherever they can, you know, being being missionaries. We also have uh, a, a, if you want to give a gift to... Nate and Cheryl for this is uh, for them before they leave. Uh, just put your name or put a name with it, or if it's just cash, if it's something that you have for them, uh, put your name with it, put their name with it, I guess, and hand it in the back, or hand it to them directly, whichever one works the best for you. And we also have the luncheon today after second service to have uh, with Nate and Cheryl before they leave. Without further ado, I think that's everything, so I will pray and we'll head into worship. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this time you've given us to come together. God, I pray that you will just open our hearts to the message and to the worship. God, I pray that you will be with us. Lord, pray that you will be with the Promise Inn Homeless Shelter and God, help, help them help the homeless and help them get themselves back on their feet and moving forward with their lives. God, I pray that you'll be with Adams Community Church as you just help the leaders there be uh, guided by your spirit, spirit spirit-led in teaching and preaching. And Lord, I pray that you will just allow your will to work through that church. God, I pray that you will be with Mark and Kathy in Haiti. Lord, as they continue to help the staff at Church of God and they help the hospitals, they're they're helping with the health care and helping with serving others and that heart of serving, Lord, help them be refueled and just to keep that heart so they do not burn out. Lord, I pray that you will help them share the gospel. God, I pray another prayer over Nate and Cheryl, Lord, as this is Nate's last Sunday with us, but it is not his last Sunday with you. God, I pray that wherever he goes, uh, he will follow you, that he will serve you, he will serve. He will do your will, Lord. And be with them for the trip, for the journey. Be with Cheryl, Lord. Allow her to just have her heart for you and have her have this fire to want to know you more. Even now, God, even when they're moving to a plan that they don't completely see all the way through, but you do, God. God, I pray that you be with them. In your heavenly name, amen. Would you please stand? I'm going to share from Matthew 6 this morning. The words of Jesus. Matthew 6. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In verse 27, he says, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So we can gather, we can celebrate, we cast our worries aside. Give all your worries and give all your cares to him because he cares for you. So let's celebrate this morning. Let's sing, today is the day.
set in my heart and mind on you, Jesus. Reaching my hands to yours, leaving so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good. Oh, it's good. Today is a day you have made. God is good, isn't he? All the time. All the time. God is good. Father, we just thank you for this morning, God. We thank you for your presence. We thank you just for everything that we tend to take for granted in our lives, Lord. Lord, we know that you are a way maker. You are a miracle worker. But sometimes we forget what you've already done in our lives. Help us not to forget where you've taken us from, Father. Help us to know whatever we're going through today, God, that you will make a way even when we don't understand it and we can't perceive it and we don't see it, but help us to believe it, Lord, that you are working. We just praise you.
I just want to share what the Lord's put in my heart this morning. It's Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion, and it haunts me day and night. Against you, you alone, have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just, for I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom, God. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. And I pray that is my prayer this morning. That is my prayer for every single person here, that God died for each of us. We so often take that for granted day to day. Oh, yeah, he died on the cross for my sins. Do you know what that means? That means you are pure, you are blameless in his sight. Through the lens of Jesus Christ, he sees perfection, the sinless lamb of God. He died for you, he died for me, so that we could live for him. So let's sing the song, Refiner's Fire, and just keep that in mind. No matter how far we have fallen, no matter what we've done, he is there. If we just turn from our sin and we turn back to him.
thank you this morning. Lord, purify our hearts, purify our minds, that they may glorify you. We may glorify you in all we do, in all we say, Father. Help us to realize the gift that you have given us of eternal life, Lord. If we would just not trust in our ways, not trust in our wisdom, our understanding, God. Help us to trust you and submit to you in our ways, to trust you with all of our heart. And lean not on our understanding, Father. Give us your wisdom that only comes from you, pure, peaceable wisdom that comes from you, God. Every gift comes down from the Father of lights. And we are so thankful, God, creating us a clean heart and renew a right spirit, a loyal spirit within us, God, to serve you, the one and only, the one true living God. Bless this time we have to share as Pastor Nate shares from your word. And I pray, God, that it would just overwhelm us with your love and your mercy and your grace for each of us. Help us to realize, to comprehend the love that you have for us. Give us just a taste of that this morning. We just praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I love that. I used to. First show. I shouldn't say this is the first show. In the, <laughs> I won't do it, I promise. In the South, when we first went out there, I was just so taken by the culture and whatever, and I would see when I'd get out there, we only had one service, but it was, I don't remember what time. Anyway, we'd get together, and it, it always felt like you had to kind of prime it a little bit, right? Like there's just people who were not quite there yet. And I would start with something very similar to what you just said. I'd say, good morning, just as loud as I could. And everybody, everybody except for Cheryl laughed. Um, Cheryl <laughs> Cheryl thought that was the worst thing I could possibly do, especially in the South, and I probably did it every service for like six months. Um, Cheryl, Cheryl would be like, I'm not going to go till after you're done if you're going to do that, because it's just so offensive. How I many of you know I'm, the, I'm, not, uh, I'm not easily led away from things that, are, that I think I should do, so anyway, anyway, but I did eventually listen, and I eventually straightened up my act, so. How many of you are glad you're here this morning? Oh, yeah. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. I'm thrilled to be here. I really am. Um, real quick, and I'll try to, I, I wasn't here for the announcements, but I know you covered them. Um, one, I don't know if it made the bulletin or not, um, Jason Robles, um, he's first service, I guess. Uh, he works on a lot of Sundays, so a lot of even first service people don't know him very well. Uh, Bible study stuff, midweek, everybody knows him. Uh, his wife was here at first service. He is actually boarding the plane Tuesday for the Ukraine. Yes, so thank, thank the Lord. That's been a, a, a journey, as most of you know. He came and shared his heart, and, and I was so, so blessed by Jason. If you know him very well, you know that's who he was. That's, that was the authentic, real deal. And he used terminologies, if we'd have coached him, I'd have coached him otherwise, right? You don't say things like, well, I might not even be able to go, but I think I'm going to go. But that's just how pure he is, right? He was just like, I don't know. They're, it's kind of like selection. But if you want to get behind it and pray, if you feel like you support, great. i got to raise money if I go. He just wasn't sure, but he was sure he wanted to go and felt like he needed to go. And so it just kind of, in my mind, I'm like, you don't tell people that you're asking for prayer and support like I might not be able to go, right? It's just it's not a veteran missionary move. But bless his heart, he just was so straightforward, and I love that about Jason. That's just how, if you know him, that's just who he is. And I'm just praising God today that he brought it full circle and his wife was all excited. She didn't get up and talk because that's not what she does. But she was just thrilled at first service because Jason is finally able to see God use him in a way that he felt like God was calling him to weeks and weeks ago. So it's all coming together, and he's boarding the plane. So be praying for Jason, all that to say. Uh, be praying for him. 
Um, he is, man, he's got some specific targeted mission stuff to do, and, and I'm real, real excited. This is us. Amen? This is us. When you see brothers and sisters step out and do these things that are strictly, straight up God-authored, and we have prayerfully supported him, we have financially supported him, this is God. This is our partnering with him. So while he's going and being used, that's an extension of you. And you need to just really embrace that in your heart. That's an extension of you. So be, amen, great, great news. Um, also, there's one other thing. Um, yeah, some of this I think is probably already covered. I will tell you this um, will be our last, won't be our last Sunday here, I pray, but our last Sunday for a while uh, here in the Pendleton Church of God. Uh, we are planning on leaving, I think, tomorrow is the plan. We'll see if, the, if we can actually pull that off, but I think we will. Um, but I just want to tell you from our hearts, and we'll probably get a chance to say it later, I hope, uh, we love each and every one of you. We always have. Um, for whatever reason, God absolutely just broke our hearts for you when we came, and you. And the miracle was that God broke your hearts for us, and you accepted us and made us feel apart. So, um, And you've put up with us for the better part of eight years, so that's pretty awesome. Um, I'm grateful that you guys have, have uh, yeah, have allowed us to serve with you and alongside you. Um, I guess I just want to say this. This is, if I if God leads us at all in this direction, travel, vacation, or permanent, whatever, um, this is my church home right here in this part of the world. So I fully intend to be able to come back, and if you'll let me, I'll even share and preach if you give me the chance. If you don't, I'll listen to somebody else preach. That's all good. But know this, my intention and my heart, and I've said this over and over, and I'm going to keep saying it if you'll listen, is that I firmly intend to share the God dots for Cheryl and I for weeks and weeks and months and years to come. As God does amazing things in our lives, I'm going to share it. And if you don't want to hear it, don't tell me. Because <laughs> I think you do. And in my mind, you do. So I'm going to do it. We're going to share. And here's the flip side of that. This is where it gets real important for Cheryl and I. Not only are we going to share with you as often as we can of the things that God has done, like you've sent us, because I believe the same God that sent me here is now sending us. So I trust that you are fully embracing that. So we want to keep you updated on what's going on in our lives and what God's doing. And on the flip side of that is I want you to let us know, right? So whether it's a post or a call or a text or email or whatever medium you choose to use, uh, I pray that you will do that. And please don't get like we all do. Pretty soon I'm like, well, Mariah doesn't care. She's busy. Her and her husband and family, they're so busy. They don't care what's going on in our lives. And then you get around Mariah, and Mariah will scold me for not letting them know, right? So I'm just kidding. She doesn't scold me, but yes, she would. That's actually true. But right, it's like, it's, it's like there's this love that God has merged our hearts with, and I just want you to know it's not over because we're having to pull out and be somewhere else for a while. Does that make sense? So please share. Family's family, right? So please, please, please. I've shared that here. We've got people that Cheryl and I have had the privilege of serving with all over the world that, I mean, literally, sometimes it's years, sadly, that we, didn't, we weren't able to connect on that level in a phone call. And it's like, man, we've never left. Like, we were always right there. So real important. Please share what God's doing. Please share your God dots. We want to know. Amen? We're going to be in Mark chapter 7. Um, this was a challenging thing for me walking in the door because, again, it's kind of the irony, God's sense of humor, and the irony doesn't escape me. Um, it is literally in this context going to be talking about honoring your parents, which I didn't plan from way back, but obviously God did, <laughs> and so there's that. Um, the other side is it's a very challenging passage. Um, it, does, it seems pretty straightforward. If you've been in church for 376 years like me, um, a lot of this is going to be like, okay, well, yeah, yeah, we've heard that before. Yeah, of course, of course. And I would tell you that one of the biggest challenges is Jesus is talking to church people, right? He's talking to church people. In, in the particular case of our text today, church leadership. So these are people that if you'd ask them, and this is where we're going to kind of touch on today, if you ask them straight up, do you know God, do you know the Lord, they would have said yes. And if you ask them, do you know what's right and wrong, they'd have said yes. And if they'd have said, you'd have said, hey, so... Can I follow you as to know how to walk this out and be a Christian or be a, be a believer? Can I follow you? They would have said, yes. And yet it's those people who were literally pushing and teaching and forcing and requiring and judging people based on the things that they said, this is the right way, this is the path, this is what we do, this is what you do if you're going to make it to heaven, this is what you do to have a relationship with God. Those people, for those things... Jesus, everybody say Jesus, the guy we follow, amen, 
Okay, that would have been a good time to say amen. I'm just saying. Amen. The guy we follow, amen. amen. Make sure I'm in the right room. All right? So it's not just religion. It's not just faith. It's not just, you know, good club environment. It's Jesus. And hopefully you've heard me say that for eight years. You've heard other pastors say it for a lot longer than that. My point is that, that has been our, our creed. He and his word, that's what we follow. That's what we trust. That's our, our anchor. He said the very things that they pushed so hard as a matter of fact were not only not right, but they were on a path that clearly did not lead them not only to heaven, it did not lead them into a relationship with God at all. Isn't that tragic? How can you possibly attend? Can, can I just say honestly without offending anybody here, but say, I love, I love Pastor, Nate. Pastor Nate one more time. Amen. <laughs> right? Here's what I want you to hear me say, right? These are people who are church people. And yet they had acquired a taste for tradition and traditional ways and man-made doctrines, if you will. And they had just decided and proclaimed that those were from God. Isn't it tragic that a person can attend all their life? Can I just be really honest? These people were far more faithful than us as a general statement. Amen? Far more. They, they tithed religiously, for lack of a better word. They tithed, tithed religiously. They fasted religiously. Anybody here fast twice this week? Don't raise your hand if you did. It tears the whole thing down. Amen? Right? So they fasted religiously. They tithed religiously. They dressed religiously. They showed up religiously. They taught religiously. They were the ones. Isn't it tragic that you can literally live your whole life in your garage and still not be a car? But that's what they did. They literally spent their whole life being religious only to find out the Son of God shows up to say, you don't even know my dad. What a heartbreaking thing. And you know why I know it's heartbreaking? Because I'm a recovering Pharisee. Anybody here recovering like me? I'm Nate. I'm a recovering Pharisee. <laughs> if I say, hi, Nate. Okay. So I can, tell who, I can tell who's had this routine and not. Some of you are so, some of you have been so good most of your life, you're like, what's he saying? <laughs> You'll get it later, it's okay. My point is, is that that's what happens, right? We've got religious people that Jesus is dealing with, and he loves them. Now part of me wants to go, hey, he's just like exit stage left, just get out. You're so ridiculous, just go. But he doesn't. And we're going to see in our text today, he loves them. He calls out the truth. What a... A brainstorm right there, right? To love someone enough that you share the truth with them. Not once, but like five times in the same text. That's love, yeah? Any of you ever raised kids? Anybody? Did you ever have to tell your kid more than once? Any of them? We had five. I never had to repeat myself ever. So, no, not true. In fact, and this is what really has to do with this, right? That's not just to be funny. It's serious. In fact, you, I hope you see the, the, the heart of Christ right here. It's strong. It's very strong. But it's not strong in hatred. It's strong in love. I say again, it's not strong in hatred. It's not strong in condemnation. It's strong in love. Just like me with my kids, right? Any one of them, I tell them, hey, when I'm going to go to work, when I come home, your, your room needs to be clean. And you hear that famous line, okay, Dad. Any of your kids ever lie to you like that? It's okay. It's not just mine. Tell me it's not just mine. Right? So I come home and it's not done. Listen, I don't say, you're out. I told you to clean your room. I was very specific and you didn't. Go find you a place to live. Go sleep under the bridge. I'm done. How many of you know as far as just entitlement, there's my house, my rules. I could. Most of you moms in the house are like, you better not. <laughs> Why? Because I love my kids. <laughs> right? Exactly. You cook your own breakfast. No. I, I was just like, I just, I would tell them again. Now, I, we wouldn't, you know, not so much Cheryl, but I would enforce things and, and like some pretty restrict, pretty tough things sometimes. But at the end of the day, listen, the reason I kept telling them was because I loved them. It wasn't because I hated them. It wasn't because I was like wanting to kick them out. It's because I loved them. So I always knew that if they ignored me, that was not a life skill that was going to fare well for them. Amen. I mean, not immediately or, or later, even for other people, right? It's important. So I would begin to tell them again. And Jesus, in this text, that's what he's going to do. He's going to approach people that are so religiously steeped, they're so churched, 
that they've missed the reason they're going to church. They're so church that they've literally missed God in the process. And they've replaced, canceled out, that's what this verse is going to call it. They've canceled out, if you will, the power of the reveal of God through Scripture and, and through His presence. They're canceling it out by literally taking their own man-made things or that have been passed down to them and saying that these things are from God. Everybody okay? And Jesus comes along and loves them enough to say, eh, you don't know my dad or you wouldn't say these things. You don't know my dad or you wouldn't replace a relationship with my dad to be able to hold on to all these traditional things. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how, well, I will say this. How many of you love control? I'm going to ask you to be honest now. You're in church. How many of you love control? Right? We have this thing in us. It's like, hey, I don't want to be that guy that actually says yes, but yes, I do. <laughs> right? It's just safer. Thank you. And, and at some point, the whole religious understanding, not just in, in the text today, but always, is the same as a club, is the same as a baseball team, is the same as a football team, is the same as a work environment. Anybody ever had con- fight for control at work? <gasps> of course. It's human. It's the flesh, right? We want control because it's safer. I can control that environment. And it's not so much want running around with a hammer and trying to keep people in line. It's just, it's just, it feels warmer inside, right? It feels warmer. It's like it just feels more comfortable for me to be in control and to, to know what's going to happen next. Here's what you do. You, if you mess around and follow the Lord very long, pretty soon he's going to mess around. And no matter what you think your, your journey is, no matter how many years you think you're going to be in Pendleton, Oregon, he rewrites a part of your story and he sends you to take care of your folks. And here's the, this, this is going to stagger some of you. He didn't even ask me. <laughs> some of you right now are like, he what? He didn't ask? Of course, we're the center of his universe. He has to ask us. No. Turns out, turns out that's not true, right? So he says, you want to follow me? Here's what it looks like. This is my heart. My heart is not for you to do all these wonderful things that I might even bless ultimately. But if you neglect these things, everybody say the word neglect. Notice it's not just sheer rebellion, because we can preach rebellion, amen? That makes it easy to preach. Oh, you're just going to snub God? Good luck with that. Let me stand over here. I can preach that. But that's not what we're talking about here. He's not talking about people who just hate God. In fact, he's talking about people that actually rejoice, raise both hands, and say they love God. Right? Well, you haven't read the text. We'll read the text. Here we go. Mark 7. <laughs> here we go. It says, one day some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem, that's important, to see Jesus, who was, we know, in Galilee. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. And just FYI, for some of you that are like us, that's not for the sake of cleanliness, right? We'll get to that in a minute. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, did not, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands. And by the way, if you read history, they'll tell you it literally has to be cupped. It can't be just cupped. Um, as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they have immersed their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Ceremony is a key word here. Jesus replied, you amazing people, thank you for finding out my disciples' shortcomings. I will correct that immediately. No. The guy we follow, Jesus, Son of God, God the Son, said it this way. Jesus replied, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's laws and substitute your own tradition. And then he said, again, do you hear this? I want you to hear the repeat. It's like me talking to my kids. Do you hear that? He's telling them, and then he's giving them more definition. Here's why you need to clean your room. Right? And, and, and I, did I tell you? I did tell you. And here's the deal. Now I'm telling you, you're skillful at avoiding what you're supposed to do. Here's what he says. 
Jesus replied, he says, um, where, I've lost my place, I'm sorry. Nine, there we go. He said, for the worship is farce, you ignore God's law, substitute your own traditions. Verse 9, then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. For instance, and then he gives this one. It's, again, I'm, the irony is not lost on me. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God. Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. Can we all agree that wouldn't fly by our current culture? But it was Bible in the Old Testament, right? But you say, here it is, Jesus is talking to them. You say it's all right for people to say to their parents, Sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give God what I would have given you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents, and so you cancel the Word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. And then Jesus called to the crowd. So first he's talking to the religious leaders, and now he's talking to the crowd. And he says, all of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. And then Jesus went into the house to get away from the crowd, and his disciples, who are obviously still with him, asked him what he meant by the parable he'd just used. Don't you understand either, he asked. Can't you see that the food you put into your body can't defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through your stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Can we just say to a Jewish community, this was break through stuff. And, he, and then he added, if that wasn't enough, it's what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Thank goodness our second service people, we don't have a problem with any of those things. All these vile things, boy, I wish he hadn't put that in there, just to be honest. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. Now, can I, now you know what I mean when I said this was a hard passage, amen? Because this is one of those troubling things. First of all, he includes pride in the same batch as adultery and murder and calls them all vile. And I'm just finding that quite offensive, to be honest, because I, don't, I haven't killed anybody today. I haven't committed adultery, but I might have struggled with a little bit of pride today. Okay, I've struggled with a lot of pride today. Okay, I'm prideful. What do you want from me? And he says all these things are vile before God. So this is where it gets a little bit edgy. This is not a, and again, I need you, I need you to hear, hear the text, right? This is not him saying, I don't love you. This is not him saying, I don't care about you, you religious nuts. This is not him saying, you disciples are so ridiculous, it takes you 10 times to even get it. He's not saying any of that. He loves them enough that he just keeps telling them the truth. And I need you to hear that because that's not the culturally sound way in 2022 in our country. In our country, if I tell Ken, brother, I'm struggling with some stuff. Can we work on some stuff? Because I'm you're sharing some stuff with me, and I recognize, man, we, we, need, we need to work on that. Because that doesn't, I know your heart's for Christ. That doesn't seem like it bears Christ right now. Can we work on that? Because And I got stuff too. I need, you to, I need you to watch. I'm giving you permission in this relationship. And he has done this, by the way. That's why I'm picking on him. I'm giving him permission to literally, literally walk with this journey with me. And when I do things, or my attitude is not what it should be, it's not, not just not quite. That's the way we say it from the pulpit, right? My attitude is just not quite what it should be. Sometimes it's vile. And I need somebody that loves me not to patronize me, not to, to just sweep it under the rugs. Oh, that's our pastor. Just put it under here. For heaven's sake, I'm glad it was just a handful of us that saw that side of Pastor Nate. Put, let's put it under the carpet. We don't, I don't want to talk about that. We might lose a member. I need people to come alongside me and say, I love you. I care about you. Let's do this life together. We're all pushing to grow in this. We're all pushing to, to allow God to change us over time. And it starts with having people that will come alongside, just like Jesus, that love them like his own kids, and said, you, you should know better, but I see that you don't. So I need you to hear me. You don't know my dad. So let me help you. Let me bring this thing into the light. And if you'll allow me to bring it into the light, you'll find forgiveness. You'll find hope. You'll find direction. You'll find 
you'll find that I can put you on the right path. Listen, the road you're on, the bridge you're about to cross, does not get you to heaven. That's why he's calling all those things vile. Do you see it? The road you're on, the bridge you're about to cross, does not get you there. You have convinced yourself it does. Oh, how scary that is in my soul. You have convinced yourself it does. You have convinced yourself that as long as we all get along and as long as we're all a club and as long as we all show up once in a while, as long as we're all doing our part and we can somehow kind of keep control and keep people from doing to, um, oh, Hunter, oh, he worries me because I can't keep control of Hunter, right? I'm like, I, I try, I want, I want control of everybody, then we kind of know what to expect. Well, you have convinced yourself that that bridge is going to get you all the way to heaven. That bridge is what it is to know God and follow God. That's the way because you've done it for so long. And I'm telling you, Jesus shows up and just wrecks it. And he says to these religious leaders, church leaders, religious leaders, you don't know my dad. And I love you enough. I'm going to tell you again and again and again until I hope at least one or two of you get it. Amen? Everybody glad you came today? This is, we're going to unpack this. This is what I would tell you. This is what's so scary to me. Those people that he loved enough to tell repeatedly, they were church leaders. They were religious leaders. And I would tell you the very things, this is important, the very things that they pushed, the very things that they taught, the very things that they claimed were from God were the very things that Jesus shows up as the Son of God and says, that's offensive to my dad. The very things they taught as right, if you're going to be right, this is what you do. We show up on Sunday morning. If you really love the Lord, you come to second service. You sit for this long. If it goes too long, you have every right to be offended because we don't do it too long. And your chair better be comfy because that's part of this. And oh, for heaven's sake, they painted the ceiling black. Right? I, I shared with the first service, and I, I, don't, think you, I don't think they're here <laughs> at all. So I'll just share this. We had a, a, a family, we lost a family over the lights that go this way and that way. And, and I remember the day it happened because I was so blessed. I mean, I'm not, black wasn't my first choice, but it looks cool, right, and now that it's up. So I was all excited, and we were having this celebration. We're doing the thing, and all these people that work so hard, and it looks so great. And, and this lady came up to me after church. She said, what, what is this? That we've never had those lights like that. I said, no, isn't it great? She was like, No. No. I said, well, Tim hasn't adjusted them yet. Maybe he'll get up there with a the scaffold and we'll adjust them. Maybe it's, is it your, it's too bright. Uh, no, it's just, no. I know. I just, I can't do that. It's distracting. I said, they're just lights. If you listen to me preach long enough, I'll be distracting. <laughs> they're just lights. And she was like, they need to come down. I can't, I don't know if I can come to a church that has lights like that. And she came the next week, and she caught me afterwards. She said, apparently you have taken my suggestion under consideration, and you've decided, like it was up to me, you've decided you're going to leave the lights. I'm going to have to find a different church. And I just looked at her, and I said, sis, I am so sorry, but we're not taking the lights down. If, if you're in a section that offends you or hurts your eyes, we can, we can adjust them. We can, right, we can do all kinds of things. But no, I, I can't have him take those all down. It wasn't even my decision, but no. And she kept her word. We haven't seen her since, her and her family. Now, and, and please hear me. If you know her or him or them, right, please know. I love these people. I don't know out against them. Here's my point. How can we get so hung up on anything that we completely lose sight of the glorious things God is trying to do in our lives? Right? That is exactly what these Pharisees did these leaders of, of the church. The Bible says they came from Jerusalem. Jesus is in Galilee, right? I'm not going to get real specific, but that's about 80 miles, give or take. You look this up, you can Google it because everybody knows Google's right. You can look this up, and first century foot traffic, right? Best case, four days. Calm, calm journey, five days, right? Steady, just trekking along, staying somewhere at night. So four or five days. So we'll just call it four. We'll make it easy. These people left their church pious perches, and they literally trekked four days to get to Jesus. Now, here's, here's a recap, right, just so we're all on the same page. Here's a recap. What we know up to this point, so they traveled from Jerusalem because they heard about Jesus. Here's what we know that they were told. He has healed supernaturally 
hundreds of people at this point, hundreds, maybe thousands, of sickness and disease. We know that he has delivered miraculously and set free the demon-possessed, the people of the communities that were just a just an out, they were outcasts. They couldn't even be involved anymore and because they were so consumed with the demonic forces in their life. And Jesus, at his word, at his touch, healed them completely. And now they are part of society. And they're healed and is whole. And the testimony is amazing. These people heard those stories. We just watched that in, the, in the text just before that Jesus has literally fed over probably the better part of 20,000 people with a kid's sack lunch. We know they've heard the story and they've made this track. He has literally walked on water. They can believe it or not, but they've certainly heard the story by now. And he literally calmed the raging sea at his voice command. This is who they came to to talk to. This is who they'd walked four days to get to at least. And when they get there, what they noticed was that his disciples weren't washing their hands correctly. Listen real carefully. They had a spirit in them. But it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was a critical spirit. They didn't see the glorious things God was doing. They didn't see the grace Jesus was pouring out. They didn't see the healing power that he was sharing with anybody that would believe. They didn't see the the, the 20,000 people walking away so full there were 12 more baskets of leftovers out of a sack lunch. They've ignored all of that. You notice they're not even talking to Jesus about any of that. It never comes up that we have record of. There's no conversation from these guys that says, we've heard about this amazing stuff. Let's talk about that first. And oh, by the way, we've got to talk about your disciples. They're not following the ceremony. They go straight to the ceremonial malfunction. And I would tell you that when I get upset with that, and I think that's so ridiculous. Who would do that? You know who would do that? Me. You say, oh, no, Pastor, if anybody's just down on religion, it's you. That's true. But I'm a recovering Pharisee to the core. And I would tell you that most of us are because we have tradition. We hold so tightly because we love how it feels. And here's the thing. If, listen, this is a little bit harsh, but this is true. What I've had to come to grips with is if I'm more religious than Jesus, I'm wrong. If you're more religious than Jesus, you're wrong. If you're more traditional and you hold tighter to your traditions than Jesus, that means you're holding on to an idol and you're wrong. It just makes you a little bit ill, doesn't it? (laughs) Like what, right? These are people that have done this their whole life and Jesus comes along and says, you don't know my dad. Bless your hearts. That's a South thing, by the way. I'm getting used to saying it again. Uh, Just bless your hearts. But I'm telling you, this is real, right? This is what's happening. And I would tell you that again, this happens everywhere I've ever been. And it will happen to me if I'm not careful. In a church we pastored years and years ago, um, I, don't, I shouldn't even share this, it's so ugly, but we went there, we'd been there for a little while, church got started showing up, and we saw some people saved, and saw some other people that weren't quite Christians yet, but they were coming, and they really kind of were kicking the tire, and they were pretty excited. This one young family in particular, we were excited about that. Uh, I think they had 2.3 kids, I can't remember. Anyway, point is they, they were coming, and they liked it, and they kind of, they hadn't been Christians, but they really liked the flavor, and they liked the fact that it was like straightforward, and the, the seemed to be all tied to the word, not just somebody's opinion. They liked that, and they were like, hey, if we're going to make a change in our life, it seems like it should be this, right? We're not sure about all the other stuff we know about religion, but this sounds good. We, that day, it was like the second or third time they'd been there, that day we had a fellowship downstairs in the fellowship hall, which every church that's godly has a fellowship hall. So, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Tradition. So, So we get downstairs, and the wife, bless her heart, she is so excited about what God's doing in their little family. And she's like, I I think I want to be a part of this bigger family. This sounds good to me. So she goes down, and she just sees people working hard in the kitchen, and she thinks, I need to help. How many of you know we need 100 people like that? Maybe 125 people like that. Amen. Right? So, so she's excited. So she just jumps in. She sees they're just working like busy bees. So she jumps into the silverware drawer. She's like, I don't know exactly what all is going on, but I can set the table. I can set all these tables. So she goes in, pulls them out. And one of our beloved sisters, who'd been there right at 367 years, says, what are you doing? Now, keep in mind, if I'd heard this third party, I couldn't preach it. But I was standing there, and she didn't see me. She just saw the new family. Cheryl's nodding her head. She knows when she was there, right? And it was crazy. And she says, what are you doing? And she just kind of got put on the spot. So she's not assuming she's going to be attacked by these religious leaders. So she says, I'm just wanting to help. 
She said, put them, put them down. Put the silverware down. You're just making more work for us. Please leave the kitchen. And the lady just looked at her and she said, you're, you're serious? She said, yes, we got this. Just go enjoy your lunch. We got it taken care of. Please leave the kitchen. And then I made my presence known. And I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm, Pastor, I didn't see you there. Listen, they, they just don't understand. There's a lot of the, we do it our way. There's a way we do this. And she's going to not do it that way, and it's going to make more work for us. So we're just trying to be godly and encourage her to go out and be blessed with the meal. And I said, if she wants to help and it costs more work, we'll stick around after and help. Let her help. And the lady, all red-faced now, says, no, 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 it's okay, Pastor, it's okay. And she walks out, they stayed for the service, and we never saw them again. Because we have our way. We do it this way. And anything that veers from that has got to be ungodly. And I would tell you, the horrible part of that story is, is that, that those people that were in the kitchen were there when we left. All the families, no doubt, that God wanted to send us and wanted to work with, most of them, they had to be incredibly rigid and incredibly strong-willed, or they could have never made it. My, my reason for sharing that is it ties to this, right? We've got a family that's excited about the Lord. They're excited. They're not Christians. They're wanting to be. They're, they're, they, they're talking the talk. They're like, we've got to do this. I've got to learn a little bit more, but it sounds good to me. And instead of seeing what God's doing, and shutting everything else down to make sure we embrace and enjoy and engage with what God's doing, we let people know this is what we do. And if they don't come back, God didn't want them anyway. And you say, well, Pastor, you just, that's a little rough. These people killed Jesus eventually. I know the story. Most of you do too. So it does get a little sensitive. Yeah? This conviction that we hold to our traditions to because it feels right, feels good, feels warm. And if it means exiting people out, oh well. And I would just encourage you to hear from Jesus, the guy we follow. He loves them and he tells them over and over and over, this is not, you don't know my dad, this is not the way. This is not the way. Everybody okay? I'm not okay, I shouldn't have shared that. I mean, I, I think I was supposed to, but it's rough. He says, in, ta- in context, he says, Isaiah, I love this, because you know who knew everything Isaiah had ever written were all these guys. And he says, Isaiah was right about it when he prophesied about you. When Isaiah prophesied, did Isaiah know these people 700 years later? No, but this is Jesus, and what did Jesus say? So Isaiah was writing it to them 700 years ago, before this. And yet Jesus himself says, it's still true about you. Amen? It's still true about you. Here's what he says in Isaiah 29. Says, and so the Lord says, these people say they're mine, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me, listen, is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. And if you are like me and you just like, you read a word like that, you're like, I think I know what it means, but I'm not going to be satisfied with that. So I looked it up. And this is interesting. This is what rote in context means. It's to learn something in order to be able to repeat it from memory rather than understand it. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting, right? Is that not spot on, right? I don't know how they translate that into the the word rope, but that's just like money. It's like to literally do something religiously, to learn it so that I don't even have to understand it. I don't have to live it. I just have to be able to repeat it. Man, that sounds like a lot of the church world today. And I would just tell you, that's been me. That's been me. In fact, we were, Cheryl and I, we were laughing and talking about it a few weeks ago. We were going through some old pictures because when you move, that's what you do. And you try to throw out as many as you can, you can't, and whatever. <laughs> right? And Cheryl's like, you got to go through this box. And I'm like, no more. Get behind me, Satan. No more. <laughs> In some of these, there were competitions from years and years and years ago. And there's like Bible competitions. Nothing wrong with Bible competitions, by the way. I love that. But I was literally looking back. I could tell you in my young adult life, I had long since forgotten and forsaken any understanding of the truth. But man, I could quote some verses to win. And I would just tell you again, please don't go down that trap. That road does not lead. Nothing wrong with Scripture memory. Please don't leave here and say, Pastor Nate said, don't worry about memorizing your Scripture. You need it in your heart. You need it in your head. It's good. But don't do it to win. Do it to understand it. Do it to apply it. Do it to let it in. Amen? Do it to let it in. So he exhorts the crowd. He tells them, understand, it's not 
It's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside. Again, and then he tells his disciples, don't you understand, right? It's what comes from the inside that defiles you. What is Jesus saying? Why does he keep saying this? What does he mean that comes from the inside? And then he goes into this list, and it's not an all-exclusive list, by the way, or all-inclusive list, but I would tell you, listen, at the end of the day, what he's saying very clearly to me is that all these things are vile before God. All of them. Were the Pharisees prideful? Yes, let me answer that for you. Yes, very much. Were these religious leaders prideful? Yes, for sure. Were they, as Jesus said, were they trying desperately to keep the outside of the cup shiny and clean so that when anybody saw it, it looked religious, it looked Christian, or it wasn't Christian for them, but it was Jewish, right? But it's like, they were God's people. We wanted to look like God's people. This is what God's people do. We keep that outside of the cup clean. And Jesus, the guy we follow, all the way home said, the inside of your cup is filthy. And if your whole priority, if your understanding of what it is to follow my dad is to make sure the outside of your cup is clean, when the inside of your cup is filthy, that road will never get you there. That bridge is out. Amen? That bridge is out. When I was a kid, when I was a young teenager, I had the privilege of meeting a pastor that was an evangelist, and he was a little bit older when he told the story, but he told it as as if it was true, and I believe it was 100%. He had grown up in the South, long story short, uh, had a call on his life when he was a young man in his 20s. Back then, they did a lot of, remember uh, revivals, anybody? Right, they do revivals, you basically preach till you preach out. You preach three or four days, if the Lord's showing up, you preach some more. And it was really a good thing, but we just don't have our culture like that too much anymore. So that's what he was doing. He was traveling miles and miles and miles away from home, rural churches, and he was preaching his heart out. Had a good, a good three or four day stint. God showed up, good things. Gets in his car and it's late on Sunday night and he's taking this road back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He knows the way home. He's got to cross over the Red River. And he's, once he does, the minute he crosses that bridge over, he knows he's about three miles from his house. So he's almost, you know how you get when you're really tired? You're just kind of like on autopilot. He's just cruising. It's rural. Not many, he's not facing many cars, so he's just heading on. And he knows he's getting closer and closer to the bridges before GPS. He knows he's getting close just by, the, by the, how long it's taken him. And he knows if he gets to the bridge, he gets across the bridge. He's gone over a thousand times. He's just three miles from home. He'll almost be home. He'll get in his bed, and it'll all be great. He's driving along, probably slightly breaking the speed limit. He didn't tell me exactly how much, but I'm sure he was. And he's clipping along, and just before he gets to the bridge over Red River, he sees a maniac in his lane wailing and screaming and jumping up and down and screaming and hollering. And he's got his window down because they didn't have a lot of AC back then. And he's listening. He's like, that guy's screaming at me. And he's, on, he's like, here it is. This is here, here the whole story right here. He's a Christian. He's serving the Lord. He's doing it his way. He knows the way. He's exhausted. He's spent. He just wants to get home. He doesn't have time to mess with this maniac. Amen? You get it. He's driving along. So his godly response is, I'll just pull over into the other lane and get around him. As he does, this maniac jumps in the other lane, into his lane now, and he's screaming and hollering. He gets back into the other one. The guy jumps over to the other lane. He's screaming and wailing his arms. He's just screaming at the top of his lungs. He's just he's getting closer and closer. He's like, I don't want to hit this man, but he won't get out of my way. He switches one more time. The guy does the same thing, jumps in front of him. Now he's almost to him. He slams on his brakes, and now this young preacher, all full of the Holy Spirit, is angry. He jumps out of his car, reaches up over the hood of his car, and grabs this guy and puts him on the hood. He says, what's wrong with you? You're out of your mind. Tears, he noticed, were just pouring out of his face. He said, the bridge is out. I didn't want you to die too. I watched the bus just go over with a bus load of kids just got back from a game. I tried to scream and they wouldn't stop. He said, I just made up my mind. I wasn't letting one more car go over that bridge. The bridge is out and you'll die. So whatever I had to do, I was going to stop you from going over. He said, and in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to him so clear. And he thought, that's exactly what Jesus has tried to do to me my whole journey. I know the way. I know how to get home. I know exactly what to do. I've gone over this bridge a thousand times. It's a bridge I can control. And Jesus is screaming with love, whatever it takes, I need to stop you because that bridge is out. You can't get where you need to go crossing that bridge. Just because this is familiar to you doesn't mean it's not out and you're going to perish. I never forgot that story. 
And today, when I was a little over this week, we were studying through this again, I realized this is very, very applicable. This is not a, a Savior condemning the church world. This is not a Savior saying that everybody that's religious or everybody that has traditions, that there aren't any good traditions, that's not what's being said here. He's saying that you have adopted a way that you're claiming is my debt. And you're claiming that if you take this path, it's going to get you home and other people go with you. And Jesus, the guy we're supposed to be listening to, shows up and makes it crystal clear that that bridge is out. But he offers you a way home. But you've got to set the traditions and the pride aside. If I wanted to beat up this last part of the list, I would, except most of it applies to me. <laughs> and so, so I'm going to skip that. I'm not skipping it. I'm just telling you. What I heard from that loud and clear was before God, my pride is every bit as bad as murder. Any times in my life that I have struggled with sexual immorality or lustful desires or any of those things, you know, here's the, here's the truth. About, about all but about two or three of those on the list Jesus gave, anybody behind this pulpit could struggle with all of them. And some of you right now are like, preacher, that's exactly right. That's why we got to get the right guy. And it's going to have to be something we got to really dial this in because we don't want that. And I'm telling you, if that's your heart, you're missing the whole story. The story is for you and the person, whoever it is, right here. But it's for you. Perhaps God's trying to save you from going over the bridge. And if he is, maybe he needs you collectively or individually to help keep whoever's in this role, whoever's in leadership across the board, lovingly accountable to his word. And can I just be honest? If there was more of us that took this as serious as I'm talking about and you loved me or anybody else enough to come alongside them in love, in love, I say again, in love, please don't throw a hatchet at me, right? But in love and say, hey, let's do this journey together. Let's do this together. We got stuff. I got stuff. You got stuff. Let's fix this together. Let's lean into the Holy Spirit together. Let's see what God wants me to do. Do you know how valuable it would be to me? You know how many... Oh, I didn't say this the first service, but I'm supposed to say it right now. You know how valuable it is to me to have men of God who are willing to do that with me right now? Do you have any idea? You couldn't possibly. You couldn't possibly know unless you have them too. You just couldn't. Men of God that love me enough to close the door behind them and, not, and I know what we're going to talk about doesn't go any further. And we're just going to talk and they're willing to say, Pastor, I see some things going on in your heart and life right now, man. What can we be praying about? Because I see you're struggling. You know who doesn't do that? About 99% of the church world. Either you're intimidated by somebody that's behind the pulpit, which is completely unbiblical, or you don't love them enough to come alongside them in truth. But that's what the Word says. Amen? That's what the Word says. Now, I'm not giving you guys a license to condemn because that's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about coming alongside somebody in love. They hold you accountable. You hold them accountable. How many of you know we always like the other half? Right? I love holding you accountable. I'm just not really, really high on you holding me accountable. Right? Is it just me? So, so what do we get from this? What's the takeaway? I would tell you there's a few things, but just to go through really quick, I'm hearing Jesus say to me, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Right? Beware of the, of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the yeast. And I love the fact that he used yeast. He could have used a thousand things, but using yeast, if you're, how many of you have baked recently? How many of you used leaven or yeast at all? Isn't it funny? That, how much does it take to completely change the structure of the loaf or whatever you're baking? It just takes a little. Not much. Just a little. You say, well, that's just, that's just one thing. I don't know if that applies to everything. Listen to me. The scriptures are really clear, and it says it over. Jesus says it over and over and over. It just takes a little leaven to leaven the entire loaf. It just takes a little yeast. Isn't that our culture right now? Can you see it? I had this conversation with my kids who weren't quite grown, and we were talking about conservative values. Now we're getting a little bit off track here, but I think you'll get the idea. I was talking about those values, and we were talking about things like things allowed in school, things being taught in school, things not taught in school, things not allowed in school. And we were talking about that, and my kids in their teens were like, Dad, come on. 
It's, you're, you're so worried sick that it's going to go to the far extremes. Nobody's talking about that right now. It's not going to go there. Can we all agree that in 2022, we're already all over there? It just takes a little leaven to leaven the whole loaf. Now, how do we apply that to our personal lives? And I would tell you the message is from Jesus. Beware. Watch out. If you know the Holy Spirit's dealing with you and you're like, yeah, well, I didn't kill anybody. I'm not actually guilty of adultery this week. Not physical, at least. Uh, I'm not really all that greedy. I don't think I lied to anybody this week. I am a little envious. I watch those commercials and I'm like, I got to have that. Okay, I am definitely prideful and I, I certainly act a fool sometimes. He says, they're all vile. They're all vile. And I'm, this is not to bring everybody down. This is to bring you up. To help you understand in love, Jesus loves you. And perhaps for some of us more than just me, the bridge you're planning on crossing your whole life and not changing path, you need to hear that today, that that bridge is out. It's either religious or it's licentious, which means that you're your own God, right? You do whatever you want to do on your terms. How many of you know that's American? Amen or oh me? And all I'm saying is it doesn't matter what the culture is. You can't blame the culture. When you face God just like me, when I face him, I'm not going to be able to blame Ken. I'm not going to be able to blame my wife. Some of you guys right now are like, well, I'm, I'm holding that card just in case. I'm not going to be able to blame my family. I'm not going to be able to blame my friends. I'm not going to be able to blame other pastors. I'm going to have to say I was all in. And as you kept graciously repeating and telling me what I needed to do to be more like you and less like me, I kept submitting. Or I'm going to say I did it my way and I get all of eternity to pay for my sins. Let me just close with this. And it's a question. Do you see, do you see in the red letters, do you see an incredibly high call to sanctification? Do you see it? You say, Pastor, that's a big word. What do you mean sanctification? Sanctification is literally a maturity in Christ to be set aside by Christ for a lifetime of growth to bring him glory. Right? It's to literally be set aside as holy. His. His. Exclusively his. To be set aside, to grow in maturity spiritually, to know I'm not there. I'm not what I'm going to be, but I am fully committed today. Whatever he's revealed to me today, I am best I know I'm all in. And if it means changing everything in my world, I'm in. That's a step of sanctification. Do you not hear the loving call to a higher level of sanctification in the red letters today? I pray you do. Because this is not Pastor Nate or any other pastor saying you need to live a higher level of morals. Do you know these guys were behaviorally modified like times 10? The people he was talking to had this outside thing down. In fact, I kind of envy them in some ways, right? They were like really, really, they had this down. And Jesus is talking to them because he loves them and he says, it's not about that. The inside is defiled. All this other stuff on the outside looks so good. I'm, that's, that's great. But that's, it's defiling you from the inside, not the outside. So whatever God's dealing with you on right now, I would ask you to surrender that. I would ask you to hear the high call of sanctification. And listen, here's where it gets tough. If you're like me, this is where it gets sticky. Because today, right now, as the Holy Spirit's even dealing with me, I'm like, yes, Lord, I'm in. I know it's going to be tough. You're going to say go this way, and I want to go that way. And I'm, my, histor my history, I only go this way. And you're going to say, no, that way leads to destruction. You've got to go this way. Today, in this crowd, I want to say yes. Tomorrow, it's Monday. And tomorrow, my tendencies are to go back to me trying to be in control. And my call to sanctification that I've gotten from the Lord today becomes a little less in priority. And I would beg you, hear the call of God today. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here this morning and you know, and I don't even, I don't even want to try to clarify what or from what side or how or how deep, but if like me, you have felt the Holy Spirit through his word awaken your heart to a deeper 
call to sanctification, to a deeper call, a richer call, not what's on the outside, but change from the inside out. If you feel that, and you know today that you are trying desperately to say yes to the Lord, you might not even know what it's going to look like tomorrow, but you are saying yes to the Lord today. Would you slip up your hand? Nobody looking around so we can pray together. Amen. Wherever you are, amen. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. God is so good. Luke, would you come up and dismiss us in prayer this morning? Father God, we just thank you for the word that you spoke to us this morning, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to just receive it fully, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Nate's boldness in sharing with us all these things, Lord. We ask right now that our religiousness would be cast aside and that our heart would be surrendered to you. Lord God, prepare in us this next season for the, the things you're calling us to and the, the opportunities we have to, to meet you where you're sending us, Lord, and what you're doing. Lord, I pray over Pastor Nate and Cheryl right now as you're sending them off to the next mission field for right now their family and those around there. Lord, I just ask right now a blessing over them as they travel. I, I pray for wisdom and discernment for the associations and the ties and the things that they're called to. Lord, let the enemy not distract them one moment. Let them be on mission in the center of your will. Lord God, we pray that right here for us as we are transitioning and trusting your plan. Lord, we ask right now that we would be open to it. Lord, we love you and we love what you're doing. You've created in us a clean heart like David. Give us understanding in these days. Lord, we know there's hard times coming. We just want to be ready to help those that you're calling us to help. Let us be the hands and feet that you want us to be for your call, Lord. We love you. Lord, all these that have opened their heart up and surrendered to you today, Lord, bless them. Bring that openness to you just move in us this week God we want this to not just stop today but it would build and be watered the seed of we surrender the the religious and the idolatries of all these things and we step into what it is you're doing and calling us to Lord Jesus we praise you and we thank you we give you this day in your name we pray amen downstairs yeah there's a luncheon of stuff that's been prepared, so yeah.